let's turn to incremental modularization. Um, a very important aspect and a source of a very or a reason for a very long discussion I had with Oliver Drotboom from Spring, Spring Data fame is that we disagreed a lot on what this term means. And I think mostly he's been right. Um, this term is misleading in the sense that you might think all I have to do to be have modular code is apply the module system. That, that, that's not true. <laughs> and this term kind of like lends itself to that interpretation. My approach is, or my, my, my frame of mind was, you have a project, it's split into several, several jars, most likely if it's a bit larger. You probably did your best to make this a good split and have jars that make sense, that separate concerns. Um, now all you want to do is add the module system to it. You want to use the module system for reliable configuration, for safe encapsulation. You basically want to get something on top. That is what we're doing here. I'm not going to tell you, and neither does the book, by the way. It does not tell you how to create, um, how to take a big code base and decide where module boundaries should be. That's a different problem. I'm going to assume that you know how to do that or that you already did that and that you now want to use the module system to enforce those boundaries. Okay, so once again, um, you have jars already. We're just going to turn jars into modules. That's all I'm going to do. And why is that even an option? Because most module systems, you can't do that. Either everything is a module or nothing is a module. But we already covered that. Um, there is this unnamed module thing which helps you with that. But there's something else which is called automatic modules. And we're now going to see how these two mechanisms, unnamed module and automatic modules, how they help you with incremental modularization. And this is based on a very specific thing that I did not really discuss. I kind of gave the impression that the class path is for jars, and the like plain jars, and the module path is for modular jars, jars with the module info class in there. And surely these are their main focuses. But the interesting bit is, you can take a modular jar and put it onto the class path. Or you can take a plain jar and put it to the module path. So this two by two matrix with which path are you using and what kind of jar are you using is completely filled. All of these options are allowed and they do behave differently. And it's very important to, to understand that and how to use that. Okay, so let's start with the unnamed module, why the class path just works. I already showed you this. The unnamed module, is what the module system creates for the entire class path content. The entire class path content gets stuffed into the unnamed module, has no name, as I mentioned. We're going to see very soon now why that becomes critically important, that fact. It can read all modules, it can export all packages, and within it, the chaos of the class path lives on. We covered that. Let's go back to the advent um, project and let's fiddle with that a bit. That's also what we did with the monitor application that we just discussed. We basically put, not basically, we did put all the jars, which means our jars, in this case that's Advent and Calendar apparently, and all the dependencies, in this case that's just Guava, the orange bubbles, you can see how artistically inclined I am, by the way. Uh, we put all these jars onto the class path, and then the module system comes along, draws a big box around it and says, this is the unnamed module. And the unnamed module can implicitly read all the other modules, that's what these dotted lines are there for. They can implicitly read all the other modules, in this case, all the JDK modules, and everything is fine. This works. This is what we just did. All our modules, oh, sorry, all the jars that we built in the monitor application on, for Java 11, they now run in the unnamed module. The problem is, if you start modularizing your code, then you have to put your dependencies into these requires directives. You have to say your module requires your dependency. If your dependency is not yet a module and you put it onto the class path, then it's in the class path. It's in the unnamed module. But you cannot require unnamed. And the reason for that is that you reference a module by its name. And the, module, and the unnamed module's name is not unnamed. That's a sentence <laughs> that should go into... <laughs> it's a standard example for good, uh, for, good, for good explanations. So the name of the unnamed module is not unnamed. It doesn't have a name. You cannot reference it. 
You cannot require it. This does not work. You cannot put advent and calendar into proper modules onto the module path and then reference your lousy dependency which is on the class path. That will not work. This is where automatic modules come in. They are a bridge from the modules, from proper law modules to the class path. You could also see them as a buffer zone, buffer zone maybe. So, I mentioned that you can put plain jars, the old ones, right? The one with, the, with no module info class, you can put them onto the module path. And if you do that, then they get turned into an automatic module. That's important. Each of them does. All the jars on the class path end up in one unnamed module. Each jar, each plain jar on the module path gets turned into a single automatic module. And the interesting bit about an automatic module is we can start at the bottom, just like the unnamed module, it does not properly define an API, so it just exports all packages. What else can it do? Just like the unnamed module, it doesn't define dependencies, so it can just read all modules. What else can you do? Interesting bit, very interesting bit. It also can read the unnamed module. That's important. That gives it that, may, gives, that gives it that bridge capability. But its name, it does have a name. You can reference it. And its name is ideally defined by a manifest entry, or alternatively, it's derived by the jar name. So let's say you have guava19.o.jar and you put that into the module path. So guava, that jar does not have um, a manifest entry as far as I know. And if you put it into the module path, then the jar name will be used to, def to infer its name. And so then Java will, will notice that this is a version and will drop it out uh, and will give it the, this will will, uh, give it the name guava. So for this guava jar, you get an automatic module name with the name guava. And then you can reference it this way. So it looks like this now. You put advent into your calendar. By assumption, these are proper good modules. You put them into the module path, as you would expect. Somewhat surprisingly, maybe, you can also take the, the plain old guava jar and put that into the module path as well. And now the module system will draw, <laughs> will make a, will draw a box around it and turn it into a module of the name guava and then you can reference it. So, um, uh, the solid lines here are declared dependencies. Advent depends on calendar. Calendar apparently depends on XML, whatever. And calendar also depends on Guava. These are defined as requires directives. Also within the JDK are tons of those. But Guava is an automatic module and it can implicitly read all the other ones. It re reads everything that's on the module path and also reads everything that's within the JDK. To put that into one, into one matrix, you have two columns here, one for the class path and one for the module path. And what we discussed initially is the obvious choice. The regular jar goes on the class path and becomes the unnamed module. And the modular jar goes onto the module path and becomes an explicit module, a module with the module des descriptor and everything. The new, things that we, the new thing we introduced here is this one. You can use a regular jar on the module path and then it gets turned into an automatic module. And I didn't mention this, but you can also put a modular jar on the class path and it ends up in the same unnamed module. Okay, so that means if you thought, well, the class path is for old jars and the module, jar, the module path is for modular jars, then that's not the right way to see this. What you should instead keep in, what you instead have as a mental model is not what goes on the path. That's not what defines the path. What defines the path is what it's for. The class path is for the unnamed module. Whatever you put on the class path ends up in the same unnamed module. The module path is for individual modules. Whatever you put on the module path ends up being a proper individual module. If it has a module descriptor and describes its properties, great. It, if it's a plain jar and doesn't describe its properties, the module system will create them for it. Okay? Class path for a single unnamed module, module path for individual properly named modules that can be referenced. With these tools, we can have three modularization strategies. 
Bottom up is the most straightforward one. We're going to look at that with some code. And then after that, we're going to come back to the slides and look at top down inside out as well. Let's start with bottom up, as I said, very straightforward. If you have a project or if your bigger project has certain jars, certain sub projects that don't have any dependencies or that don't have any dependencies that are not yet modules. And that's a good place to start. Or if you do bottom up, then that's the place to start. You will take, you can take these jars and then turn them into modules, right? Because by, by assumption, all the dependencies are either, well, either there are none, or the dependencies are already modules, so you can properly require them. You can put them, put them into the module path, everything will work. You can work bottom up, and you can turn your jar into a module. And now the cool thing is, they still keep working on the, mod, on the class path, right? If you take a module and put it into the class path, it ends up in the unnamed module, it behaves exactly as a plain jar on the class path. That's good because that means if you decide to create a module, then that does not force your users to use it as a module. That's really powerful. You can create a module and users can be like, eh, I don't care, put them to the class path, do whatever. And then they can decide where and where to put it. And well, once you have that, then you can just go upwards from there. So we're gonna do that for a single module. Um, how do we find that though? How do we find the bottom of the dependency chain? Well, there are several ways to do this. Uh, one straightforward way is to use your dependency tool and you can say, let's call Maven validate. Um, Maven validate just checks a couple things, but the cool thing is it's a very, very quick way to get the reactor summary. This is the build order. And the reason this is the build order is because it starts with the projects that have no dependencies and then starts adding dependencies. Right? Oh, not starts adding, sorry, starts building those that depend on the one that came before. But you may have a lot of external dependencies and it would be nice to see them as well. And this is where JDEPS can come in again and can help. JDEPS, is, as I mentioned before, is really cool. So let's use JDEPS and let's ask it to create a summary because otherwise it will spill out dependencies on the package level by default, which is, I don't know, not helpful in this instance. Um, I want to go recursive because, oh wait, um, we have to make sure that we actually build the thing first. Validate is very short. At the very very first steps, it just checks a couple of things. Verify is basically the last thing before install. So, um, very almost the same word, quite different meaning. Okay, I'm not gonna type it out. Let's just copy paste the JDEPS command. I can talk you through it. JDEPS, please create a summary recursively go through all my dependencies, you will find them here, start with the main jar. And I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna explain this. Um, let's just leave it as it is. If we do that, we get this. This tells us that uh, Jackson Core jar uses Java base, for example, and Jack's BRP jar uses Java base, and uh, Jetty Util jar uses Java naming, and this is where we come in. Main jar uses all kinds of stuff. Okay, that's neat. Um, what else can we do with this? So the first thing we can do, we can decide, you know what? We just care about our own stuff. We don't care about all the other. We just want to see a dependency graph where, which involves our modules or sorry, our sub projects. We don't care about the other ones. James, once again, can do that. Uh, we can have this include here, which says just include all the packages. Sorry, remember it works on all the classes. It analyzes based on classes and then aggregates by default to packages. In this case, aggregated further um, to artifacts. So that means it, it works on fully qualified class names. And if we do it like this, we say everything that's monitor, whatever, just operate on that. That's a bit shorter now. Okay, that's nice. We get this now. Um, now comes something that's really handy. You can automatically create uh, diagrams with this. So we have a, there's an option that's called uh, dot output dot uh, output and because we create a summary it will just be a single file and we create to create the single file in this folder here. Now we don't see anything but we now get a summary dot. This is new. This wasn't there before. Okay, did this here created the summary dot file. And if we look at it then it has this syntax. Um, that's a common way to to uh, to put a graph into 
into a text form. And there are several tools that can build, um, that can create graphics out of this. I use uh, GraphWiz, which has the dot tool. Um, so let's tell it to create a PNG. As you see, I'm watching over the site here because I don't know this by heart. Let's create a summary dot. Oh, sorry, let's create summary. Let's take it input summary dot. Okay. And now we created the PNG file. And we can take a look at that. Uh, let's use Gwenview for that summary dot PNG. And there it is. Look, there's our main jar, depends on persistence, uses utils, uses Java base, REST uses Jackson core, and these, see how these have no outgoing lines? Because we didn't go further. We, we limited all our dependencies to our own packages. So while it realized that REST depends on Jackson data bind, it did not go into it any further. We can clean this up a bit. We can remove Java base because you know that just just noise. Everybody depends on Java base all the time, and we can remove the dot jar as well. And the good thing about that is, um, because we're operating on a class file, sorry, on on text file, we can use a couple of very simple tools to um, to edit them. And so on Linux, you would use set. I'm sure something similar exists for for Windows. What this means is um, replace. So in this file in place, apply this, this um, replacement. Let's not dwell over the details. This removed Java base lines. This, sorry, this removed all the lines that contain Java base. This removes all the, all the dot jar endings. And then we can repeat dot. And I'm gonna tell you in a second, why, like, why would I explain this um, in such detail? Uh, because I wanna show you how powerful this is because now we get this graph, which is much better cleaned up, very easy to read, and remember, everything I did here is a simple script that you can run at the end of your build. And I find the idea that at the end of each build, you can get a, you can get a proper representation of your actual architecture, as opposed to somebody's diagram that was, you know, photographed from a, from a whiteboard two years ago and put into Jira and never updated. This is your actual architecture. You can build this with each, you can create this with each build, put it on a screen somewhere, and then you can walk by and you can see how it changes over time. I think this is really powerful. Uh, and let's keep it around. Uh, so we can <clears throat> look at it every now and then. Because this tells us where to start. Um, this tells us that one way to start, for example, would be utils. Because it doesn't have any further dependencies. And if you want to start bottom up, you look for these bottom things that don't have any dependencies. Let's start with utils. 